Good morning and welcome to Study IQ. I am Prashant Mawani. I hope you all are in good, my dear friends. Uh, today is 10th January 2020. Day is Friday. We have many interesting articles on our table today. The first one that we are going to talk about is a continent on fire. It's about Australia. But before that, can I quickly introduce all of you to our pen drive and tablet courses? Our pen drive and tablet courses are designed by the best faculties of our nation. With the help of our pen drive and tablet courses, there are so many students out there. More than thousands of them have cleared various different competitive exams. You can do the same. You can purchase them from studyiq.com. To find out more about it, you can give us a call on the numbers that you can see on your screen. To download the PDF of today's lecture, do visit my FB page. To make it a bit easier for you, what you can do is just hit the follow button and you will get notifications on your FB apps. You can join this Telegram channel and please make sure that you share this lecture with other students as well. Don't forget to hit the like button and do subscribe to our YouTube channel. So let's talk about Australia for the second time. Earlier on as well, we have talked about Australia. We talked about Indian Ocean Diapole. We have talked about how it will affect the people of Australia and other things. Today, I will start with a thing called Tinder Box Effect. Let me write it down here. It's called Tinder Box Effect. Now, how it works or what exactly it is. You can see on your screen uh, states of Australia. So you have Queensland here and you have New South Wales, right? So this portion of Australia is predominantly under bushfire at present as we are speaking now, as you can see here on this infographic as well. So these two states of Australia, they are going through this tinder box effect because for a, a bit of long time now, uh, they are receiving uh, less rainfall. Less rainfall means things are going to be very dry. And then you have high temperature. So these two things are taking place. Less rainfall, rainfall and uh, temperature is going up every year. Or it's staying high, I would say. So this is creating a sort of, uh, you can say, a proper perfect uh, place. It has these two places or these two states have become a perfect place for this fire. And uh, this bushfire is not something uh, new for Australia. Australia goes through bushfire every year. But the size of this bushfire is, is the biggest the Australia has ever witnessed. You won't believe it, but it is bigger than the size of a country called uh, Switzerland. Devastated over this bushfire has devastated over 10 million hectares of land. It has killed more than 25 people. And what I can tell you about uh, animals, half a billion animals are killed in this bushfire. And I strongly believe that this is just a small teaser. You know, in, in our culture, in India, we say that this is just a, just a trailer. It's not the whole film. So this is just a small teaser, I would say, not even a trailer, it's a small teaser, or I would say a digital poster, you know, of, of what we are going to face if we don't change the way things are going on now. This fire, it, it started somewhere in August 2019, and nearly when you hit August in Australia, you, you start seeing sunny days. And at present, it, the, the, what we say, this, um, this summer is at its peak. So things are not going to uh, stop here, right? Uh, things are going, I mean, I do pray for Australia, but things are not going to, practically and geographically speaking, it's going to take a bit of more time. Now, the thing is, uh, on your screen, you have uh, PM Scott Morrison. Uh, do you know what he's holding in his hand? Let me zoom it up for you guys so you can see here. He is having a big piece of coal in his hand and he's not in his office, he's in Parliament of Australia. There was a time when he talked about uh, the importance of coal, why we need to develop money, innovation and things like that. But at present, he's facing the angst of citizens of Australia. As I told you earlier on as well, that Australia is not famous for looking after its environment. And unfortunately, nowadays, there are so many countries out there they are not that good or they are infamous when it comes to looking after their environment. So PM uh, Scott Morrison has sought the downplay, the impact of uh, climate change early on. He said that uh, things are not that bad. It's all propaganda and other things. But now we can, or in fact, I'm sure he's also uh, 
uh, convinced that things are happening because of climate change. And for a very long period of time, uh, scientific community has uh, said this thing that coal industry has a strong hold over politics in Australia. You can imagine that political parties would be getting funding from this coal industry and when you have your preferred political party as a ruling party or a forming government, then they will design policies that will suit your industry. So it's a sort of nexus between business and politicians or political parties. Scientists have said that this this sort of catastrophes that we are witnessing in different parts of the world, like Australia, you have this bushfire. All these things are taking place because of just one degree Celsius increase in global average temperature. Just imagine what will happen when you have an addition of 0.5 degrees Celsius in global average temperature. There are scientists who are claiming that if by this end of this century or in few years, let's say in 2050, if we hit uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius, today we are somewhere around 1 degree Celsius. If, if the global average temperature is 1.5 degrees Celsius more than it used to be in this pre-industrial era, then it will bring bigger fires in Australia once, at least once every eight years. And India is also a country, right? We also face uh, forest fires, as I've told you. So... It's not just Australia, it's for the whole world. Again, as a community, as human beings, we have to think that we have to, we cannot, uh, you know, continue this destruction anymore. And things are getting, and days as well, you know, are getting uh, hotter. And uh, uh, if we don't stop now, then uh, future is going to be very bleak. Moving on to second item. Now, we were talking about calls, isn't it, in Australia, like... Coal is a very, at present, I would say, a negative topic in Australia. But in India, there are some positive things going on as far as coal sector is concerned. Now, dear friends, uh, yesterday I told you that uh, you should check out my daily financial news analysis lecture. Remember, uh, if uh, some of you have checked it, the, the thing is uh, that lecture is not in English language. It's going to be in both Hindi and English. The written language will be on the screen. You will find English, uh, but the... Uh, audio will be in Hindi. So if it suits you, then definitely do check out because here is a good example. Yesterday itself, I have talked about, we have analyzed uh, this uh, cabinet decision on coal sector. And today you can see that uh, you find that particular topic on Hindu and Hindu's uh, editorial page. Or In fact, it's an editorial of uh, the Hindu newspaper today, Mining, Mining Deep. So this indicates that uh, the topics that we are selecting on uh, daily financial news analysis are uh, are important and uh, you know they are relevant for your awareness as well as examination. Now mining deep this one is about union cabinet's uh, recent decision to amend uh, mineral laws uh, this older mineral laws and it has basically promulgated an ordinance uh, mineral laws ordinance 2020. Now Aims or benefits, I would say it will liberalize norms for entry into coal mining. Earlier on, entry was very limited, restricted. If you have expertise in this field and if you have uh, enough funding, then only you can enter. So that was the condition. The other condition was, uh, uh, or you can say restriction, was laid by end use restriction and use restriction was there so what it means basically is say if you are a mining company or let's say you are a steel producing country you know that steel producing industry they require huge amount of coal for their furnaces so if you have let's say mining operation as well and if you have got 100 kilo of coal from your mine and you are going to use 80 kilo only so the rest 20 kilo that is already there with you, it's a sort of raw material. You can sell it to someone. But under this end use restrictions, uh, it was not allowed. But now you can freely um, sell your coal to anyone you like, any buyer of your choice. So this sort of uh, relaxation will help us a lot and particularly this mining industry. As far as our nation is concerned, last year we have imported 
coal worth 171000 crore rupees uh, 235 million tons was imported and 200 out of this 235 100 million ton was not uh, substitu substitutable that means uh, the grade of this 100 million was was a bit higher or we don't have this grade coal in our country or we don't we don't have it in in our minds so there is only one option that we have to buy it from someone else the rest 135 million tons we have this coal available in our minds but because of some restrictions and remember back in 2014 uh, supreme court has cancelled the license of 204 coal blocks and out of this 204 only 89 were reallocated and out of this 89 only 29 are operational so you can see a big chunk of coal uh, licenses or blocks are not active at present and because of this thing we have to import huge amount of coal a coal a raw material that is already available in our mines we have to purchase it paying huge amount of money so with this relaxation we are going to see large investments hopefully and it will create more jobs it will boost the demand of mining equipment and heavy commercial vehicles and uh, it's applicable to all uh, factories right if you are a power producing company if you are a steel producing con uh, company domestic or foreign you can invest in coal uh, even if you don't have that much expertise right you can come here you can invest if you have money then you can invest right so things are a bit more liberal now i would say and the most important side is that it's not just money or foreign direct investment of course fdi is important uh, no doubt about it but with fdi what you get is sophisticated mining technology what we are trying to achieve here is to attract big names you know global giant companies they can come here they can invest in our coal mining they can produce coal for us and of course they will make profit but with the help of them we are going to learn so many new things uh, as far as sophisticated mining technology is concerned the coal india's monopoly will come to an end so i can see something that took place with bsnl remember when bsnl was having a monopoly but introduction of uh, private players has destroyed bsnl but we have to make sure that of course bsnl is destroyed because uh, bsnl was not able to upgrade itself and we don't want to see the same thing with cil cil is a maharatna cil stands for coal india limited and it's a maharatna public sector unit of course uh, roughly 3 lakh people are working for CIL so we need to make sure that uh, it stays in the business and for that the management of CIL has to be innovative and uh, competitive so we have uh, done with this two editorials so now we are going to talk about CDS that is Chief of Defense Staff dear friends uh, remember a few days ago we have analyzed one article on CDS and I told you that uh, that article was uh, negative about CDS here you get an article that is positive about CDS so now we have both views negative as well as positive and this is not going to be the end of CDS articles uh, I am sure that we are going to find some more articles on CDS in future but at present we are going to focus on this one so on your screen you have Bipin Rawat Bipin Rawat is first chief of defense staff of our country small tiny yet important information one more important information and i'm drawing a small star here remember this uh, you may find you know uh, mcqs particularly in your prelims right i'm talking about mcqs you find this match the following where you have been given two uh, boxes a and b so here you may find committees and committees and their subject isn't it match the following thing so remember when you find this Cargill review committee in 2000 of 2001 Cargill review committee back in 2001 recommended that India should have one chief of defense staff it was recommended back in 2001 very important information keep this information in your mind make sure you revise it because you find this type of questions and CDS is something that is in news it's part of current affairs and in future exams you may find least you can expect one question on this cds uh, in prelims as well or maybe in defense as well now i'm going to take you through some important points the first one cds will consult and solicit the views of the services but the final judgment will be the cds alone uh, 
when it comes to army navy air force uh, if army is uh, expressing some uh, some views about uh, about army or that particular service then cd it can go to cds cds will talk about it cds will solicit the views of services when it comes to acquisition like uh, purchasing tanks let's say for army or purchasing a sort of uh, helicopter for air force or maybe a tiny ship for for navy it will uh, consult and solicit but the final judgment will be of cds now this is about acquisition or some basic things that we are talking here right cds will be the principal military advisor to the defense minister a very important point who is going to be the defense who is going to be the principal military advisor to the defense minister defense secretary uh, defense minister or no, of course uh, you have minister over here so it's going to be uh, defense secretary cds army chief you know you can get this sort of options so it's cds now procurement see here is the difference here we were talking about acquisition that uh, particular service their their views on acquisition final view will be of cds of course but it will be about acquisition acquisition here means that what we need but when it comes to purchasing that item when it comes to procurement cds will not play a role right it will be the big ticket items will remain under this department of defense under the firm control of department of defense so this is your third point fourth one the cds is also vested with the authority to provide directives to the three chiefs now there is a difference in directives and command directives is more like uh, nudging these three chiefs right uh, command is something clear authority and in military or in defense uh, command basically means that uh, you are passing some orders that you have to take this sort of action so cds does not enjoy any command authority remember when you have command word in your in your question right so cds does not let me clarify again to you guys that cds does not enjoy any command authority over three services uh, this will be your point number 6 point number 5 will be cds will lead the department of military affairs doma dealing with three services now if cds is going to be the lead of doma that means when it comes to promotions when it comes to travel when it comes to appointment appointments to key posts let me say overseas assignments all these things will be led by doma and that is the head cds cds will also perform an advisory role in nuclear command authority point number 7 and i would say again a very important point advisory when it comes to nuclear command authority cds will have a lead no cds will only perform as an advisor to nuclear command authority and it 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 depends on nuclear command authority uh, whether to press that nuclear power button or not and core function of cds is to foster greater synergy between three services uh, which we all know about but at the same time point number 8a is operational synergy and uh, 8b will be keep inter service frictions to a minimum as less as possible and for this reason only general rawat has sought the establishment of an air defense command adc Uh, the report will be ready by june 2020 and uh, adc will make sure that we have a nationwide coverage as well as uh, we don't have this uh, uh, fratricide fratricide ma- means uh, you know during a war uh, when a country's army or air force is hitting its own navy army or air force so internal issues will not take place internal fight will not take place or by mistake of course as an infantry officer he has to be careful because um, general rawat is coming from army so he has to make sure that he is not biased towards army he is 
uh, impartial uh, for for all the three services. Uh, then he has to ensure that uh, CDS will also ensure that uh, wasteful expenditure and duplication of equipment is not taking place. And uh, again, a very, very important point here. And I, I'm, I'm sure you are aware about this thing. I think I have uh, told you about, but still we find this thing here, that CDS role is equally about fostering better cooperation between MOD bureaucracy and the services. So... The main role of CDS, one of the most important role is CDS is like a bridge between our defense forces and civilian government. Right? So this office or this post will work as a bridge. It will connect both these uh, important pillars. Now, uh, three things on which uh, CDS can focus on. The first one is reducing the number of personnel we have uh, so many foot soldiers in our army and we don't need that many foot soldiers particularly nowadays we have so many technology and so many things that does not mean that we don't need human beings right human beings are most important thing when it comes to uh, defense uh, we need human beings we need foot foot soldiers but uh, we don't need them in that big quantity uh, I remember a few years ago, maybe in 2014 or 15, right, uh, China has uh, provided uh, VRS, Voluntary Retirement uh, Scheme, to roughly speaking uh, 3 lakh Chinese soldiers. So China and other countries are also, they are cutting down when it comes to foot soldiers. Then second thing, use of artificial intelligence. China has already started using artificial intelligence and we can do the same. Just imagine your tank, right, a tank, a tank or a battle uh, truck it can automatically with the help of this uh, uh, artificial intelligence travel from one place to another it can defend itself and other things so we need this sort of technology and the third and the most important thing is promoting native or local research and development this is most important thing today we talk about many times you know when we are having a chat with our friends and when we are talking on you know th when the topic is uh, defense or defense products we talk about israel we talk about russia we talk about uh, france and uh, uk usa germany but we hardly talk about one thing and that is r and d the main reason why you have all these countries ruling this defense business is because they have invested in r and d long time ago and they are enjoying the fruits of this r and d and it's not that they did something they are continuously investing in r and d Unfortunately, we are not that good when it comes to investing in R&D, but now we do understand, now we are sure uh, things are quite clear to us that without local or native research and development, uh, we cannot uh, survive. And if we have to depend on someone else for all these defense products, then we cannot say that our country is, is self-reliant and uh, secure. Now, I have got one interesting infographic for you guys. Of course, you can download the PDF of today's lecture and then you can go through it, right? It's about CDS, right? There's so many things about CDS, buttons and uh, shoulder rank badge and other things. So go through it. It's interesting. So we are done with these three items. Now we'll quickly go through this one. Uh, this one you can totally reject. It's not important for your examination. This one is a little bit important, right? It's about uh, quality. It's about ethics. Uh, it's about not your ethics paper, but it's about ethic in, ethics in uh, research. Teaching research ethics better. Now it's interesting to find that uh, UGC has finally decided that uh, PhD scholars, they have to compulsorily go through uh, this ethics uh, coursework, uh, it's going to be their pre-registration coursework and they have to compulsory go through it and without that they cannot move ahead. Uh, the course carries uh, two credits and uh, 30 teaching hours. And uh, this uh, course, you know, is uh, going to talk about so many things. It's going to cover plagiarism and uh, falsification, fabrication, misrepresentation of data, selective reporting, duplicate publication, segregation of data publishing and uh, publishing as multiple papers and other things it covers uh, several aspects of research conduct publication ethics misconduct open access publishing databases and research metrics now the big problem in our country that we find is i'm not saying that all of them but many of them or few of them are 
practicing all these things, plagiarisms, and particularly state universities. You find uh, all these negative things going on in many state universities. Quality of uh, research is not up to the mark. It's not par with global ranks or global level. And because of all this plagiarism and all these things, right, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not cre creating scholars uh, or, or these people. They just get degrees and PhD degrees and then they are teaching to someone else. And that is a bit of problem for, for our education system. Now, UGC has decided that this all things uh, should, be, should be taught to all our PhD scholars. But the problem is... It is only providing five hours of course, right? That's it. In five magical hours, how can you learn everything about this plagiarism, falsification and all these things? If UGC is serious, then it should create a proper separate course with sufficient teaching hours to make sure that these things are uh, deeply down there in all our PhD scholars. And uh, this is something that we cannot allow. We cannot allow the quality of research to deteriorate. Moving on to next item, and this one is the last one of the day. It's about a nation losing democratic steam. Now, for dear friends, uh, every newspaper has uh, what I have observed in the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, I have been going through many newspapers, and uh, so I know that uh, so many newspapers, right, I means different newspapers, they have their own viewpoint. Uh, some of them are tilted towards uh, left, some of them are tilted towards right, some of them are supporting, um, you know, some other parties. Uh, but as a student, you have to choose your own view. As, it, as an educator, it's my duty as well, and it's my job as well, and it's my responsibility to make sure that I do not promote any sort of left, right, or any other political views. I have to present things as neutral as possible and that's what I have been doing and I will be doing, right? So here this article is tilted towards one particular side and it's not happy with the other side. So you can go through it and I highly recommend you guys to go through it, right? You have to go through it because if you don't go through it, then you will not understand how things are going on. I'm not saying it is bad. I'm not saying it is good, right? I'm just uh, witnessing it from a distance. But of course, I'm going to take you through some important points, some important questions. Now, first point that we find that is important, and these are the questions that we need to ask to ourselves, to our government, or the government should ask to itself. Like this article is saying, in one stroke, New Delhi distant itself from friendly states like Dhaka and Kabul. And this particular article is about CAA, that because of CAA, Dhaka and Kabul are not happy with India. We are not that uh, good friends with uh, Islamabad anyways, but the distance has increased. Now, I'll leave it on you guys to decide whether that is right or wrong. The second important thing, and I think uh, that this is right, that we are, uh, we can go through this United Nations special repertoire on minority issue. But the problem here is that it will take ages, right? The decision is not going to be that so this is something that we have to keep in mind if we go through UN. Uh, sadly, India is not part of this 1951 UN Convention on Refugees. Now, India has its own reservations, uh, but I would say that there are nine countries only in the world, and India sadly is one of them that is not that has not uh, accepted this 1951 UN Convention on Refugees. Uh, so, government should explain that why it's been so many years why we are not part of this UN Convention on uh, refugees. The other thing is, uh, and, and because of this, uh, not signing this thing, what is happening with us is that so many criminals, right, they claim that because India is not part of this uh, UN Convention of Refugees, they claim that uh, if, if you send us back to India, then India will treat us like this and that. And, you know, and so many people, they have absconded or they have escaped uh, justice uh, using this thing and India has not signed it. So, this is something that is important, right? Again, I'll leave it on you to so think about it. And then you have uh, uh, this one must challenge India's uh, Home Minister that why Muslims of different sects enduring sectarian or, or why some Muslims like Ahmadiyas, Shia, uh, Hazara, uh, this communities or this, you can say, I would say, can I use the word branches or right, uh, different communities within Muslims? 
Now, they are facing problems for a very long period of time. And uh, why we have not included them? We have included Hindus, uh, Jains, uh, Sikh, you have Parsis, uh, then you have Christians, and then you have uh, uh, Buddhists. So all these six communities are included, but uh, we should have included this one, isn't it? So this is again a question, right? Uh, but remember, there are other routes as well. People can apply for citizenship, and there are a few points here uh, that are bit, there are big questions we can we can raise, right? Saying that India is not a democratic country anymore; it is autocratic, but that's not always right, is it? But I'm not sure. What do you think? I'll leave it on you and. One more thing, uh, Amit Shah has said that uh, at present we want to focus only on this thing, but I would argue that uh, India is a big country and there are so many things that we, we, we are capable of doing multitasking. So with the same bill, we should have talked about uh, Sri Lankan Tamils as well. They are also, there are so many Tamil Sri Lankans who are suffering. News items, very quickly. Jaini students beaten up during March foreign envoys in Jammu and Kashmir. 15 member foreign envoy has uh, a delegation has arrived in Kashmir, uh, Srinagar. They're going to stay there for two days. They are going to meet so many people. A Nirbhaya case, two convicts have filed a curative pleas. A Supreme Court rebuffs a plea to implement a CAA. And uh, India and Sri Lanka had a productive talks. Uh, Sri Lankan foreign minister is... Uh, on India's visit and that's everything in today's uh, discussion dear friends uh, I hope you are learning many things from uh, this discussion right uh, and please don't forget to share this lecture with other students because I believe you people are the brand ambassador of this uh, lecture because you are the ones who are following this on a regular basis so don't forget to hit the like button and do share your views and things in the comment section I'll see you soon till then enjoy your studies God bless you all Jai Hind